Okay, well, why don't we get started? Well, I'm Rich Ozer, I'm president of the East Bay Astronomical Society. And uh, with me here is Dave Rodriguez, who I'll uh, introduce in more detail in a few moments. Uh, this is our first attempt at a virtual uh, general meeting. Um, we're obviously not the only ones nor the first to be doing this uh, in recent times. Um, I hope all of you are well and I appreciate you uh, putting up with our technical glitches and uh, seeing us in this uh, very strange version of Hollywood Squares. <laughs> so uh, tonight uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Dave Rodriguez, who is our longtime program director. Uh, in a former life, uh, Dave was a uh, lecturer at the Morrison Planetarium, uh, and he has always had a passion for science and astronomy outreach. Uh, and in fact, he won the Cliff Holmes Award uh, at RTMC many years back, uh, which is given to amateur or professional astronomers who uh, are able to you know, exhibit that passion and uh, actually make a difference in the area of science or astronomy education. And uh, so we're very lucky to have Dave talking about one of his favorite subjects, yes. which is the Apollo 13 incident. And uh, Dave had some uh, remarkable experiences uh, uh, earlier in his life uh, directly related to that, which he's going to share tonight. Um, before uh, we get started, though, I, I want to thank uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center for co-sponsoring this event and helping us publicize it. Um, they'll, they'll be a little bit happier now that it's actually on the Facebook page. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I want to thank all the uh, folks on the board of EAS to, who, who you know, agreed to uh, have us go virtual and uh, helped us through some of the technical difficulties of doing so. <coughs> Uh, please visit uh, ChabotSpace.org and EastBayAstro.org. Both are worthy organizations, and uh, it's a difficult time, especially for Chabot right now, uh, being closed. So uh, if you're thinking about uh, accumulating memberships while you're shel sheltering at home, Chabot would be a worthy investment. Very so, much so. Uh, we, we encourage you to visit their website. Um, that's about it. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce, uh, turn it over. I already introduced you. I'm going to turn it over to Dave Rodriguez and uh, mute myself here. And so, Dave, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Rich. Um, uh, I, first, before I get going, I want to apologize for all the, the technical glitches that I assure you that I will make in this program. As I said before, I'm not exactly the most technologically adept person at this. Um, again, I'm getting up to speed on Zoom like a lot of people are. Uh, and I assure you all make lots of mistakes. On the other hand, I want to say that it is a very great, first thing I want to say is thank you very much, Rich, for your very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I think Rich had a little something to do with my getting the Cliff Holmes Award, if I'm correct about that. Um, I also want to say what an honor it is to do this first virtual meeting of East Bay Astronomical Society. You know, a few months ago, we had our first virtual reality meeting, and now we're doing our first virtual meeting. And I'm going to try to do something here. Forgive me. Let's see if I can pull this off. And if I'm right, you should see a picture of me when I was extremely young. And please try not to laugh too much. I'm going to leave that there. Get play. There you go. Um, as Rich said, my name is Dave Rodriguez, and currently I am the program director for the East Bay Astronomical Society at Chabot Space and Science Center. Actually, before I get, get to going with that, I'm going to call an audible here. Pause, share. Uh, 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 uh. Forgive me, folks. Here. There we go. Um, I wanted to comment about the picture that was behind me. There we go. Uh, what you see behind me is not a giant nasal swab, uh, circa 1970. Uh, let's see if I can do it. Nope, the other way. No, I'm still doing mirror imaging. Anyway, over here. This thing, I see, okay, is in fact the omni, one of the omnidirectional antennas on the lunar module and played a critical role in rescuing the astronauts. Uh, and this picture was taken by the Apollo astronauts as they swung back around the moon on their way back to the Earth. It was taken by either Jack Swigert or uh, 
or uh, Fred Hayes. Uh, and the unusual thing about this picture is it was taken from the lunar module looking out through the docking window. And that silvery thing you see behind you there is the command module and the service module of uh, Apollo 13. Anyway, we're gonna go back to uh, the picture of, embarrassing picture of me in high school. Here we go. And so that indeed is what I look like when I was 17 years old. And please, no laughing. Uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, look exactly like this yourself when you were my age. Let's see if I can get this. I'm gonna move a bar here, folks. There we go. Dave, somebody specifically said that they're laughing. Good. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's see, I talked about that. So my story starts in 1969 when I was 17 years old. One Saturday night, upon my request, my parents took me to the Old Shabo Observatory. And here you see a, a marvelous picture of the uh, facility taken by Jim Ferreira. The big dome on the left, of course, is where Rachel was, and the smaller dome on the right is where Leah was. And this was a wonderful facility. The only problem with it was it was not earthquake safe and it was right next to the Hayward Fault. So we had to relocate the facility to the, to the new facility. Uh, across the way out of this picture was also a, a planetarium and a laboratory um, and a, uh, where programs were given by the wonderful Dr. Kingsley Whiteman. And there you see the old planetarium projector we had, I believe it was a Minolta. Kingsley was just absolutely wonderful, a great presenter. And uh, I peppered him with questions that night. And at the end of the program, he looked down at me and said, you young man should join the East Bay Astronomical Society. And I very quickly did. One thing I want to say about that first night at Chabot, it was quite magical for me for two reasons. I remember looking at the Orion Nebula through, through Leah and I remembered how gorgeous the image was. And then we looked through Saturn, looked at Saturn through Rachel, and the rings were edge on. So it was like somebody had put a crack right across the middle of the, of the eyepiece. If you've never seen the rings of Saturn edge on, I, it's, it's quite memorable. So anyway, I joined the East Bay Astronomical Society. And very soon after that, I just, I started and attended meetings. And there I met the young, brilliant, and very energetic Dr. Terry Galloway, who had recently received his PhD from Caltech. I'd never met anybody like that before. My mom was a cannery worker, my dad was a truck driver, and here I am sitting next to a guy who was talking to me about Feynman's physics. And uh, he told me about the Apollo tracking project that he was then running at Chabot. We had a bunch of high school and college kids, rather nerdy, who were using the large telescopes at Chabot to provide NASA with supplementary re navigational information during the Apollo missions to the moon. He asked me if I might be interested. Would I? I exclaimed. I had been fascinated by the space program and astronomy ever since I was four years old and had followed all of the missions very closely. Now we used three telescopes to track the Apollo missions. The smallest was this one, LEA, our eight inch Alvin Clark refractor. It's a wonderful telescope, but it doesn't have enough aperture to really track very, very faint objects. So we had trouble tracking the spacecraft after the first night with it. Second telescope we used was this one. Uh, this was the nine and a half refra uh, ref inch refractor that belonged to the East Bay Astronomical Society. Uh, and it was better, I uh, had more aperture, but only a little better. And by the way, that young man you see looking through the eyepiece there, I believe is a very young Conrad Jung, the director of our instruments. The best telescope for looking at uh, Apollo by far to track the Apollo missions was Rachel, our 20 inch telescope. And I have to say, at the time, I was thrilled at the prospect of being able to operate very large telescopes like Rachel, our 20 inch wide, 30 foot long refractor. And during my participation in the program in 69 and 1970, I was able to take part in the trackings of Apollo 10, 11, 12, and 13. Now the spacecraft as viewed through this telescope or any telescope were extraordinarily dim and hard to find. They were about a 13th magnitude star. And at first the coordinates given to us by Belcom, and I'll talk about a little bit more about who they are later on, that were given to us were substantially off by as much as a degree or so, which in astronomy can be quite a bit. So it took a little searching around to find this spacecraft, sometimes as long as about half an hour. And I remember that on the night of a typical launch, the Apollo command and service module combination were about 13th magnitude in brightness. Again, extremely dim, even for a big telescope. 
But looking through Rachel, our enormous refractor telescope, they appeared about as bright as third magnitude. A rather dim star would appear to the naked eye. After six hours or so after launch, the third stage of the Saturn V was about 500 miles behind the two spacecraft carrying the astronauts. It was a two magnitudes brighter, appearing about first, first magnitude, as bright as a first star would appear to, a bright star would appear to the naked eye. Now, the most striking thing about the visual appearance of this ensemble of spacecraft were the four panels that enclosed the lunar module, the spacecraft that would take the two astronauts to the lunar service, surface. Now, here you see a picture of the third stage of the Saturn V, and those four panels open up like this. This is actually not from a lunar mission. This was actually taken from Apollo 7, and um, some of you will argue about why there's a third stage of a Saturn V and Apollo 7. I don't want to go there, but if anybody wants to ask that question at the end of the program, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, and uh, you can actually see something below there. There's a little peninsula at the bottom of the image. That is actually, Kennedy, that's actually Cape Canaveral, where Kennedy Space Center is. Now, I'd like to play uh, a video next uh, of Terry Galloway talking about this mission and uh, what Chabot did. So I hope I can pull this up successfully. This is one place technologically where I have a little bit of trouble. So my apologies. Oops. Once again, it doesn't seem to be there. Let me try it. Hang on, folks. I think I can pull this up. Should be in Vimeo. Darn. I had it here. Oh, I do have it here. There we go. Let's see here. Uh, maximize. Play, play. Don't worry, folks, you'll see it in a few Not seconds. Early 1960s, we used to launch probes to the moon. We would miss the moon, if you can imagine that. That's how bad well, it was. It was really easy. I think you got to share the window. I will. The first, first why we were part of the optical program. Oops. I was the program manager for that program. I'm so the NASA program at Chabot was to find out what's the air resistance. If you notice that this is that is not the right fit picture. That's wrong. The atmosphere actually was way much higher. And that extra resistance screws oh, here up it is. the trajectory so that they can't get to where they want to go. That's the first problem. No, nope, so that's not it. In the base of the Saturn V, this is actually where the lunar module is, buried in here. Okay? Where is it? Then these path, these path Hang on, folks, I can get it. Off. Just bear with me. 920. In space. When we look at the telescope, you can see the tumbling or do it all the telescopes which is fine. The tumbling there we go. the light pants. And they would decay. So every every mission we had to do a report for NASA. One of the reports was a plot of the decay of the frequency of rotation and of the flashing of these FLA pants. From that they talked about the air resistance as a function of distance from the Earth. And they were able to put that into the program. When we did Apollo 7, it was so terrible. The trajectories were so terrible. We couldn't even get on the same star chart. Yeah, it was terrible. So I mean, they made a huge improvement. And so then the next thing, of course, you probably know, um, they had to turn this thing around and redock it to the lunar module. We'll be showing we'll, that. We'll show that. We'll show that in Apollo for the movie. Next slide. And here's where they are. <clears throat> here's the lunar module. Here is the uh, Command module, here is the service module. Okay? So they pulled it out, rotated this thing around the dot. When we looked at the telescope, we could see the two dots. You see one dot, and you can see the dots separating and then coming back when they re dot. And I'll show you the trajectory of how that happened. So that's the first part of it. Anybody know what the, this was called? The name? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. No. Greek name. Oh, Odyssey. Right. We weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> okay. All right, so yeah, tell me not. What's the name of this one? It is the donkey of the age of That's Aquarius. It. It. Okay, I better stop it there. Uh, so I'm going to go back now to the, uh, my, the slide part of my program and stop share. And there's green. Hang on, folks. I'm eventually going to get there. There we go. 
So this is the uh, front page of the Oakland Tribune, the Saturday uh, of the launch, Apollo 13 moves towards zero hour. At the time, the Oakland Tribune was uh, an afternoon newspaper, uh, but they had to publish it before they knew that the launch was actually gonna take place. And uh, this uh, day was very memorable for, uh, for me for two reasons. The first reason, of course, was the launch of Apollo 13. And uh, I'm gonna play a clip from that, but I'd like to mention a few things that I'd like you to watch for during this clip. First thing is notice how the music is so emotionally effective. And it sounds almost like the music from a Salvation Army band. Uh, and it's, it has religious tones. You can all, also hear an angelic choir there. And of course, it's totally appropriate because the astronauts are going up to heaven. And this is how composers come up with this stuff uh, and how they emotionally manipulate us. There, the other thing that's neat about this uh, sequence is you will see the real Marilyn Lovell seated behind the actress portraying her, Kathleen Quinlan, uh, and uh, when you look at the launch stands. Also, I want you to think about uh, poor Mary Hayes, who was seven and a half months pregnant at the time. Imagine watching your husband go up on a rocket with the power of a small atomic bomb. Now, there are a lot of technical errors in the portrayal of the actual launch, but, and Ron Howard knows this, but what he's doing is the best way for him to portray the very many things that are actually happening simultaneously. I also want to warn you that I always cry during this launch uh, uh, portrayal. Here we go. Let's see if I can uh, do this now. Uh, here. Uh, yeah. Oops, here I go again. Okay. Forgive me, I'm struggling to get back over here. I am having that problem with, uh, oh, share screen, there it is, got it. Go back over here to my slide program. Mm -hmm. Desktop too, here we go, share. Sorry about that, folks. I'm still learning how to do this. And eventually I will get there. So here's the, uh, the headline, uh, the front page of the newspaper, and I played the sequence. So that's Saturday, April 11th. Uh, and I mentioned that it was uh, very memorable for me uh, for two reasons. Not only was it the launch day, but it was early that evening that Terry checked me out on Rachel, our largest telescope. I have to say I was absolutely thrilled he had uh, already acquired the spacecraft, and it was merely my job to keep this spacecraft in the field of view of the eyepiece by very small motions of the, uh, of the telescope. I was alone in the um, observatory and had this massive telescope all to myself, and you can imagine how I must have felt. I was 17 years old, and I'm in control of an enormous professional telescope. So what did I do? I tried to move the telescope around a little bit to get a better feel for its controls. Unfortunately, I lost the spacecraft. Now, the person you see in the picture there is not me, that's Jim Perilat, about the same time, but he's in exactly the same position I was in the observing chair. And uh, I had this, the dome all to myself, and a few moments later, our old director, Kingsley Whiteman, came in and asked me, how's everything going, Dave? And I said, just fine, Mr. Whiteman. I shakily answered in my tremulous voice, hoping he wouldn't notice how nervous I sounded. I tried not to panic, and I followed a rectangular search pattern and reacquired the spacecraft in a few minutes. I waited for about 20 years to tell that story and for fear that no one would ever trust me with a telescope again. So that was the launch on Saturday, and uh, this is the young fellow Paul House. This is the cover of the Oakland Tribune on Sunday after the launch, uh, and that's uh, Paul House, who's a two-year-old boy and he gave Charlie Duke the German measles. Charlie Duke was one of the backup uh, astronauts for the mission. And in doing so, this young man may have inadvertently helped save the mission. Why? Because it caused Ken Mattingly to not be able to uh, fly on that mission, which is seen and shown in the movie. Ken Mattingly, although a very good pilot, uh, may not have been as good a person to have aboard the spacecraft as Jack Swigert, despite what you see in the movie. Jack Swigert was actually the one who wrote the emergency procedures for the command module in case there was a serious malfunction. 
Furthermore, Jack Swigert was, had been a football player. He played football at the University of Colorado. He had a very heavy build. And because of that, he was able, more able to uh, resist the cold than Ken Mattingly would have been able to. Now, the flight outbound seemed quite normal until the explosion. Unfortunately for poor Jack Swigert, he had waited until the last minute to file his tax return. Let that be a lesson to you folks. He never had enough time to file it before he left for the moon. What he didn't realize is that you can get an automatic exemption if you are out of the country on April 15th. He was most definitely out of the country. Now I'd like to play a rather humorous interchange between him and the ground controllers. Okay. Before you play that clip, there was a, um, uh, an audio optimization that you clicked on the other night when we were re rehearsing, which I think yes. we need to do again tonight. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and that is on the bottom of my share screen. There it is. Thank you, Rich. Boy, he is good at this stuff, folks. And uh, let's see if I can find that. Safari, Apollo 13 presentation. No, that's not it. Forgive me, folks, I will get there. That's not, it's not there. But maybe what I can do is click on something. I have an idea. Let's go here. Hang on. There it is. Homemade, it's this one. Open link. You folks can feel free to laugh at me. We're hard to uh, okay, there we go. And it's the, the time cue on this one is, I think, about 15 minutes. Let's see here. And I'll maximize the screen. And I will play. First day passed uneventfully. The crew performed two more audienceless television broadcasts. And on the second day, dry, humorous exchanges between the crew and mission control gave the atmosphere in Houston a tinge of relaxed preparedness. Jack Swigert's tax returns, however, were another issue. Uh -oh. Have you guys completed your income tax? Jack, we'll get with recovery and see if we can get the uh, the agent out there in the Pacific when you come back. Uh, uh, Houston, uh, this is 13. Is it, is it true that Jack's income tax return was going to be used to buy the asset fuel for the one? Well, considering that he's a bachelor and hasn't got that deduction to take, yeah. <laughs> So you can see that the mood aboard the spacecraft was, was quite happy and jocular prior to uh, the explosion. But then the explosion occurred. And uh, here's, let me go back to my program, uh, my, my slides here on desktop two. There we go. There you go, you should see it. Now I'll hit play. So I'd like to point out where the explosion occurred and when the explosion occurred. You can see it here on the diagram. It uh, happened on, um, on uh, Monday, April 13th at 10.08 p.m. All the times on this diagram are Eastern time. It actually happened at 7.08 p.m. Pacific time, which is one reason why we probably didn't see the explosion from Shabot. It was still twilight. Um, and um, on Monday, April 13th, despite what you're going to hear Terry say, I was not at the observatory. He's confusing me being there on another day. I was at home because I wanted to watch the, uh, the scheduled broadcast from the spacecraft. And you've, if you've seen the movie, you know what happened there. I remember switching from channel to channel, desperately looking for the broadcast. And suddenly on ABC, I heard Jules Bergman talking about how there had been some sort of accident aboard the spacecraft. 
Now, shortly after that moment, Kingsley received a phone call at Chabot from our contact at Bellcom, Washington. Now, I should explain who Bellcom was. When uh, President Kennedy decided we were going to go to the moon and gave that task to NASA, NASA decided they needed some really high-powered scientific help in figuring out how to do it. So they contacted Bell Labs, which was a very famous um, scientific institution at the time, a subsidiary of AT&T, of Bell Communications. And they, in turn, spun off Bellcom, and they were our contact uh, with NASA. We did everything through Bellcom and relayed our information to them. And Bellcom, uh, one of their representatives, I forget what his name was, called up Chabot at the time and asked us, I think they asked us to confirm that an explosion had actually occurred. Actually, at that time, there was a lot of confusion as to what was actually happening. Kingsley called Terry, and Terry rushed to the observatory to see if he could determine anything. Um, let me show you how far away the spacecraft actually was. This is a much more representative image. You can see where it says uh, cryogenic oxygen tank incident 55, 54, 53, the lower right part of the image there. Uh, that's NASA typical understatement for what we call an explosion. Now here is the cover of the Oakland Tribune, the Monday of the explosion. And you can see how little coverage the astronauts are getting. There's just this little tiny story there in the upper right, astronauts ready for lunar orbit. But here is what happened. I'm gonna play now the explosion scene from the movie. Right. And if you could uh, give your oxygen tanks a stir. Roger that. We've got a problem here. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Hey. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. So as you can see, uh, the astronauts were in a lot of trouble. It was uh, very dangerous. The astronauts, well, could have lost their lives. Um, I'm going to go back to my slide program now to talk a little bit more about what happened. There we go. I played the explosion scene, and I've showed you where the explosion occurred. Now, the next thing I'd like to do is play a little bit of Terry's talk about what happened that night at Chabot Observatory. I'm hoping I can find that. I should have it queued up, but I've been having some problems with that aspect of it. Let's see here. Where's Terry? Oops, I'm sorry, I have to, it appears I have to, Share computer sound, optimize. There we go. Share. Oh. No, no, that's not it. Sorry, folks. Um, shoot. Well, I would really like to play this. Hmm. Will that work? It will not work. Explosion scene. There we go. Terry. Open like maybe this will work. I hope. I've been having trouble with Vimeo. Couldn't find that page. Okay. Um, I have another way to find it. If you folks will bear with me, this is going to be rather clunky, but no, oh, that'll work. Fantastic. Okay, not there. Completely. And so we all knew, we sent runners from the telescopes, from the 20 inch out to nine and a half, out to eight, saying, is it, is it running off with you or are we losing orbiting while they had the lunar module landed with two astronauts? That didn't happen on Apollo 13, but that's the idea. Okay, so everything went pretty well. I told you we had to use the variable frequency drive. Now you might remember when you were basically above the Earth, 
and it's also going to have to track its solar rate. Solar rate. When you're looking at something at the moon, it has to track its lunar rate. So we had to have the drive running so that we could constantly change the telescope, slowing it down continuously as it's sitting back to the moon. Yeah. It's harder than it looked. So right at this point, they had the big course maneuver. And they could do that because we did a lot of work from Apollo 7 on on the trajectory of orbital mechanics to get it to come out right. And at this point, they said, you know, we're going to stir the fuel cells and get them ready. And we'll talk some more about that. When they did that, of course, when they had the explosion, we had all this big outgassing, which moved the, the trajectory of the spacecraft off course. So here we are in the 20th zone. We had TV set with rabbit ears. <laughs> you know, nobody knows what rabbit ears is. And they had Walter Cronkite on. Nobody even knows who Walter Cronkite is. Walter was our favorite. Yes. And we hated CBS. Joe Bergman. And we also had his co-manager, Walter Sharrock. And Walter Sharrock was there to help him on technical questions, right? So we got to know Walter Sharrock pretty well, actually. He was Apollo 7. And I'm going right? to tell a Wally Sharrock story. Let's see. Now, Rich, can people hear me now? Let me stop share for a few seconds. Yeah, we can hear you. Great, great. So, um, actually, that may have been a bit of a mistake. One thing I do want to say about that is, if you watch the movie Apollo 13, you'll actually see, during the explosion sequence, or, or shortly after, uh, Walter Cronkite talking with Wally Shira. It's Monday night, and April 13th, and I actually got to talk with Wally Shira about what happened. And Wally told me that uh, he had been urgently called in by CBS to come to the studio. He was actually doing a very fancy dinner that night in New York City, uh, where uh, Walter Cronkite was working from. And he, had, he was dressed up in a very, very fancy, frilly white shirt. And Walter took one look at him and said, Wally, you can't go on looking like that. Uh, I'm going to give you one of my jackets. And so if you look at carefully at the uh, video of Apollo 13, you'll see that Wally Shira is actually wearing a red jacket. He's actually wearing one of Walter Cronkite's jackets. Little side note there. Now I'm gonna skip ahead. Let's see if I can pull up Terry again. No, that's not Terry. Shoot. Anyway, I shouldn't have skipped off of that to tell that story. Uh, Vimeo, maybe that will work. Open link. Well, that won't, well, can't find page. There we go. For some reason that worked. I'm going to skip ahead on Terry's description because he shows a bit of uh, a NASA video and I want to get back to him talking about what happened at Chabot that night. Here we go. Okay, share screen. Desktop one, I think it's this. Share screen. Share. There we go. Sorry about all the, the stuff there on the screen, folks. Hmm. Try this again. Vimeo, open link. And this time, yeah, there it is. I'm going to start it up and I'll zoom in on it. It's a little hard to hear, folks. That's NASA quality audio. Focus more about that. Here we go. They open the door to call us. They show us on the telephone. Oh, okay. Okay, so sure enough. All right. So then they, they got us in the library. So they called us and said, You've got a call from Mission Control, NASA. So I ran down the hall and I sat at that very desk right there. And I got this call and they said, uh, Are you tracking a call? And I said, yes, we are. And I said, but we're not a NASA. He stopped me and he said, we need the coordinates now. Mm. Okay. So I ran back to the 20th, grabbed the star charts, told Dave, whatever you do, Dave, keep Apollo 13 <laughs> in the 20th telescope. They'll tell you some more about that. Keep it in. And I ran back with the coordinates and I was able to read to NASA where the spacecraft was seen in the star field, what the nearest stars were, and what the UT time was. So we used the WWV for the time, thank goodness we did. And, and he said, first of all, check the epic of the chart. It was 1950 epic. He said, okay. And then I gave him the stars, and he says, that's it. You got it. Next slide. 
So there it is. There's the fuel stove explosion. You already know a little bit about this. I won't waste your time with it. But that's the outgassing that moved the these, these spacecraft off course that we can all see. Next slide. So you got that call essentially within minutes of the actual event? No, it was after. Well, after. We had a six hour period between the course correction, the explosion, and then uh, getting the third correction to get it back on track. All right. So there were six hours. We were in the dome, you know, I'd say halfway through that six hours. And so but they gave us four minutes to give them the coordinates. So we didn't have a lot of choice. Terry, I think that was about 10 p.m. that night. Yeah. Yes, it was running late. Yeah. And so there's the, there you see Gene Press, and you're very happy because. Okay. I'm going to stop it there. And, oops. I learned not to do that. Go back to my slide program again, folks. Good. And play. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what actually happened during the explosion. Terry touched upon it. Again, you can see that, uh, oh, I have an idea here. Let's see if I can get the pointer to work. I tried that earlier today. And this. So forgive me, this is a little clunky, folks, but you can see a little pointer there that I'm moving around. The explosion occurred here uh, at mission elapsed, elapsed time 55 minutes, 54, 55 hours, 54 minutes. And um, let's see here. I get play again. And here you see a diagram of the spacecraft. And again, I'm going to go to my pointer here. Actually, everybody can see my cursor there, I think. So there it is in the middle. There are three components to the spacecraft system here. There's the lunar module, which I'm circling over here. That's a spacecraft that lands them on the moon. Here's the command module, whose primary purpose is to bring the astronauts safely back to Earth. And this over here is the service module. There, there are no astronauts who ever go in there. It's, it's a, a set of equipment that helps keep the astronauts alive and has rocket fuel. It has a great big rocket engine here that's supposed to bring the fire, be fired to bring the astronauts back to Earth. There's an antenna over here, an S-gain antenna, S-band antenna, that's steerable. Very, very good antenna. Uh, unfortunately, the explosion occurred right in the bay, right by this antenna. And the, the picture that I'm going to show, Actarid actually showed it as well, you can see that the whole parabola was actually sheared off. It was broken right about here during the explosion. Oops. Dave? Yes, um, Rich. If, if, if that antenna was sheared off, what were they using to communicate with Earth uh, uh, after the explosion? That's an extremely good question, Rich. Thank you for reminding me to, to mention that. Uh, there was a lot of confusion. At first, they tried to use, uh, there's an antenna that's on the other side of the service module. It's shaped like a scimitar. It's literally called a scimitar antenna. Uh, and they tried using that. But the problem was, once the explosion occurred, they had to use battery power in the command module. They hadn't started up the service, mo uh, pardon me, the lunar module yet. And the battery power aboard the, the, pardon me, the command module, this triangular section here that I'm pointing at, that's to only to be used for the re-entry back to the Earth. And they couldn't figure out a way to recharge it. And they only had a limited amount of battery time. So it was very urgent that they move as quickly as possible to go over to here to the lunar module and use it. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see something over here. It says VHF antenna. That's the omnidirectional antenna. That's the thing that looked like the giant uh, nasal swab in the back of my picture there that you can see. And then there's a steerable S-band antenna that is, uh, has a much stronger signal. Uh, there's also another S-band in-flight antenna that they were using. But the problem was that the command and service modules were in the way of the transmission to Earth. So they constantly had to shift back and forth between antennas. And it caused a great deal of confusion uh, back at mission control. There was another problem that occurred at the same time. Normally, they did not use the deep space network to communicate with the spacecraft. They used the manned space, ne uh, manned space flight network, which was a set of smaller dishes. They could call in the deep space network, which were the really big antennas, like at Goldstone, like at Madrid, like at Canberra, to communicate with the spacecraft. But at the time of the explosion, the spacecraft that was over the Pacific, and unfortunately, the, the antenna at Canberra was being used for a radio astronomy uh, 
project and they had to fly down there in Australia and, and rush and, to take off the scientific equipment. It took them several hours to do so. And that was another problem that caused confusion, which is one of the reasons why it was so important for them to figure out what was happening, which is one of the reasons why they called Chabot. I hope I didn't make that too complicated. Anyway, so here we go. Here you can see a model that actually shows the panel that was blown out during the explosion. And this little stub you see here where my cursor is, I think you can see it. That is the, uh, the mast of the uh, high gain antenna, the, the four parabolic dishes. And you can see that it's broken off very accurately. The explosion occurred in oxygen tank. I always get this confused whether it was oxygen tank number two or number one. I have it in my notes here. Um, anyway, one of the oxygen tanks uh, exploded over here. It damaged the other oxygen tank. It also dam damaged all the plumbing. And it probably damaged the, the, the internals uh, of the uh, rocket engine itself. So it was a good thing that they didn't try to explode that rocket. Let's see if I can go here now. There we go. And I'm going to, forgive me, I'm going to escape again here. Here you can see oxygen tank. Two. Yeah, it was oxygen tank two that exploded. It's the exterior tank. Inside is oxygen tank one. Here's the hydrogen tank. And they had a really neat system on the, on the service module. The, they would combine oxygen and hydrogen in the fuel cells and it would generate electricity, water, electricity, water, and of course they'd use oxygen from the tank to provide the astronauts with oxygen. When this explosion occurred, they lost all three. All three. They lost electricity, they lost water, they lost oxygen. It's hard to live without very much oxygen. So that's why they use the lunar module as a lifeboat. Here's a close-up of the, uh, the tank they had exploded. And the question has to be asked, why did the tank explode? Well, it's a very interesting story. It's rather complicated. There's a bunch of parts of the story that I won't tell you tonight. Uh, I could talk for an hour just about that. Um, you know, when I was a freshman in college, I actually attended um, a talk uh, at NASA Ames given by uh, Dr. Hans Mark, who was the head of NASA Ames at the time. And uh, he was a member of the Apollo Accident Report. And he talked about this extensively. But one of the amazing things that happened was, if you look carefully here, I think you can see my cursor. Yes, you can. Uh, there are two uh, components inside the tank. One is called a, a density sensor probe, and another one is a heater assembly. Inside that heater assembly, there is also a type of fan that would stir the liquid uh, oxygen so that it would be evenly distributed in the tank so they could measure accurately how much oxygen was in there. Now, there was also a fuse in there to make sure that uh, not too much electricity would go in there. When they originally designed the tank, the, uh, the circuitry aboard the service module was designed for, I believe, roughly 60 volts, if I remember correctly. And then for some reason, NASA decided to change the voltage up to 95 volts, direct current, by the way. However, nobody told the, uh, the subcontractor who designed the density sensor and the heater assembly. So we kept making the, the sensors and heaters for about 65 volts. So they did a test aboard the, uh, the, uh, the, the spacecraft when it was still on the ground at Kennedy Space Center. And uh, again, I could go into a lot of details here, but effectively what happened was they heated this thing up to incredibly high temperatures. The, the, the sensor fused, the thing was a ticking time bomb. And then the next, after the next few times they, they would uh, uh, flip that switch, the, uh, the stir tank switch, this thing would explode like a bomb. Uh, forgive me, that was a rather fumbled explanation, but that's the best I can do at the moment. This is a picture of, the, of an actual oxygen tank itself. Uh, Rebecca and I went to uh, the, a really great air and space museum in San Diego, and they actually have, this is a real Apollo oxygen tank. As a matter of fact, this is the tank that was taken out of Apollo 13, and the other oxygen tank was put in. And you can actually see a lot of the assembly here. And here's a little bit of a description as to what happened with the tank. Now, a lot of people ask us, could we see the explosion? And I was not at the observatory that night, even though Terry thought I was. He was actually thinking probably of somebody else. Uh, a lot of us would jump around it back and forth in different positions at the observatory. We actually would often be using all three telescopes. And I don't believe that Terry was able to see the cloud of debris around the spacecraft, but some observers in Southern California were. And as you can see, this is what it looked like. Again, here's a picture, a close-up picture of the, uh, of the tank that exploded. 
Um, by the way, when you see that uh, explosive sequence in Apollo 13, you probably saw this fellow. Uh, this is actually Ron Howard's brother. He's playing the role of Cy Liebergott, who was the ECOM controller at the time. ECOM means the, the uh, controller who's in charge of the electrical and communication systems. And uh, he was a very good controller. By the way, uh, Ron Howard's brother may look vaguely familiar to you. You may have think, think you've seen him somewhere before. Here's a very earlier incarnation of him. This is him in the old Star Trek episode, The Carbomite Maneuver, when he was, I think, about six or seven years old, playing an alien. Little Star Trek geeky stuff for you there. Here's another picture of the explosion that was taken from Southern California from a small personal observatory. The man, the wife of the astronomer who took this picture, looked at, looked at, who was looking at this, was convinced the astronauts had died. Here you see a close-up of the uh, service module. This picture was actually taken actually after they separated from the service module shortly before they returned back to Earth. And uh, I have to show you this. I'm, again, forgive me for doing this. But if you look carefully here, here's the mast of the high gain antenna. There should be four little parabolas on top there. And you can see that it's been blown away. And you can see all the debris and mess that was caused when that explosion occurred. Um, you can't see it here, but there, if you look carefully at the image, there's also some damage to the engine bell. So it's a very good thing that Gene Kranz decided not to try to fire this rocket because the whole thing might have exploded like a piece of fireworks. So here's the next day headline in the Oakland Tribune, Tuesday, uh, April 14th. And so during the three following evenings, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we followed, recorded, and reported the position of the spacecraft with the Associated Times as best we could. And this information was relayed to our contact at Belcom, Washington through a live radio phone link. And that information was combined with other information from the Deep Space Network, the Manned Space Flight Network, and the astronauts themselves using two navigational telescope systems aboard the two spacecraft. And so I, would, I do not believe it would be correct to say that Chabot saved Apollo 13. However, I do believe it is correct to say that we helped save Apollo 13. Now, here's one of those silly things that you often see in the newspapers. Did number 13 cast a spell on Apollo? Well, obviously it didn't. One can actually argue that Apollo 13 was very lucky indeed. If a whole number of things had happened differently, the astronauts would have died. And there's a great website. I highly recommend it to you. It's called 13 Things, 13 Lucky Things, or yeah, 13 Lucky Things That Helped Save Apollo 13 by Jerry Woodruff, who was one of the, uh, the engineers in the mission operations room. And he makes some extremely good points about it. Um, for example, one simple example is, if the explosion had occurred either well before or after um, uh, when it did, the astronauts almost certainly would have died. If it had exploded before, then the astronauts would have been forced to go around the moon, but they wouldn't have had enough oxygen and uh, they, uh, the lunar, they just wouldn't have made it. They didn't have enough uh, oxygen aboard the lunar module to last that long. If it had happened after, uh, let's say they'd gone, landed on the moon, come back up, then the lunar module could not have been used as a lifeboat because they just would have had the ascent stage of the lunar module and the supplies aboard that would have been totally inadequate to saving them or to moving the spacecraft. Now here's another uh, picture from the Open Tribune of uh, that time. And you see the third stage of the Saturn V hitting the moon. And this is the only successful part of the mission, according to Jim Lovell. But in some ways, it caused problems because some genius at NASA decided to have the radio frequency of the third stage of the Saturn V on the same radio frequency as the lunar module. So when the accident occurred, they were trying to communicate to the, ast to the astronauts aboard the lunar module using the radio there but the third stage of the Saturn V had not hit the moon yet and was also causing interference. Now, here's the San Francisco Chronicle, which was a morning paper. Apollo makes crucial turn and now it's a race with time. By the way, uh, one of the interesting headlines you see there is Nixon names Midwest judge for high court. That's Harry Blackman, who of course played a critical role in the, in the Roe versus Wade ruling. Um, anyway, um, one of the things I want to point out about Apollo 13 that most people don't know is, guess who has the world record for being the farthest from the Earth? The astronauts of Apollo 13 do at 2,248,655 miles. 
And the, the two reasons for that are, the moon was at apogee at the time, which is the furthest position in the moon's orbit from the Earth. And second, the free return trajectory that helped them come back to the Earth put them at 158 miles above the moon, not the usual 60 miles that all the other Apollo missions did. Now, this is a picture of Goldstone antenna, uh, one of the three big dishes that NASA uses for the Deep Space Network. But that's not what was regularly used for the Apollo missions. What was actually used was the smaller dish in the back that is part of what's called the Manned Spaceflight Network. Now, when I was a kid doing this, I remember thinking at the time, why do they need our data? Don't they have the Manned Spaceflight Network to track the position of the spacecraft? Indeed, Terry and I once raised that question with Buzz Aldrin himself at the groundbreaking ceremony for the New Shibo Space and Science Center. And Buzz's exact words were, we didn't need your data, we had the Deep Space Network. His response seemed inconsistent with the intensity with which Belcom Washington was requesting our data. And I was puzzled by this for many years. Then about 30 years after helping with the rescue, while doing a program on the USS Hornet with Alan Bean, the lunar module pilot of Apollo 12, I think I stumbled upon a possible answer. While doing this program on the deck of the USS Hornet, I struck up a conversation with someone who happened to be working at the Goldstone antenna in the Mojave Desert, the same one you see here during the flight of Apollo 13. And he told me something very interesting that suggested that maybe our data might have been more important than it would have seemed at first blush. Apparently, after the success of Apollo 11, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, cut NASA's funding. Indeed, they canceled Apollos 18, 19, and 20. And they also cut back, by the way, if you ever, when you go to Kennedy Space Center, you see this great big Saturn V on its side, that's actually Apollo 18. They also cut back on maintenance, that's what you always first cut back on when you have budget cuts, for the Deep Space Network and the Manned Space Flight Network. And due to that lack of maintenance, this gentleman aboard the Hornet told me that the big antenna you see there for the Deep Space Network I had come close to locking up. That big dish normally moves on an oil pressure pad system of about normally 14 to 16 pounds per square inch. And at the time, on the oil pad pressure system, it was only five pounds per square inch. And if that dish had locked up, it would not have been able to track the spacecraft and help provide positional information to confirm that the spacecraft was coming in on the right trajectory. Now here's another picture too that shows you the overlap between the three uh, big antennas of the Deep Space Network. Goldstone, Canberra, and Madrid. And you'll notice that uh, Chabot is on the same approximate same zone of longitude as Goldstone. So it's very possible that our positional information, especially the night before the re-entry, may have been a reassuring backup that the spacecraft was indeed re-entering on the correct, correct trajectory. One of the problems they had was the spacecraft kept shallowing in, kept coming into too narrow an angle. And the spacecraft to successfully re-enter the Earth's atmosphere had to come in at a margin of two degrees. It either could come in at about five and a half degrees inclination to the horizontal or seven and a half degrees, which if you hold out your thumb at arm's length is about the size of your fingernail. Now, uh, one of the, the, uh, the codes that Jim Lovell had established with Ken Mattingly was um, to find out if he ever actually came down with the measles was he was gonna ask them Ken, are the flowers blooming in Houston? <laughs> and you'll actually see a reference to that. And sure enough, Ken did not come down with the measles. How many astronauts does it take to rescue a crippled spacecraft? And here's the answer, seven. And you'll see in that picture there, some of, sort of like the who's who of astronauts. You'll actually see there in the middle, uh, Gene Cernan, the last man to walk on the moon. In the lower right of that picture is Alan Shepard. There's Edgar Mitchell, uh, who uh, went to the moon in Apollo 14 and a bunch of other really cool folks. Now, here's one of the headlines. Apollo, of course, could bypass Earth. And this is the reference to the fact that the, uh, the spacecraft was coming in too shallow. They kept trying to figure out what it was. They never were able to figure it out at the time. It turned out that there was the cooling system aboard the, the lunar module had a radiator system that was putting a slight amount of pressure on the spacecraft system, causing it to slightly change the trajectory. Another problem they had was they built up too much CO2. And so NASA have sent up some information to uh, build a, a bypass. The problem was that the lithium hydroxide canisters that they used aboard the command module were square. 
and the lithium hydroxide receptacles uh, and canisters on the lunar module were round. So they had to figure out some way to adapt the, uh, the command module's lithium hydroxide canisters so they walk in the, work in the lunar module. And this is the rig that they attached using duct tape, um, hoses, and uh, it was quite, a, quite an uh, elaborate uh, um, setup. Now here's a picture. Uh, I love this picture. It's a picture of, uh, of uh, Marilyn uh, Lovell the, night, the day before the landing, I believe. And she has a visitor, and this is John McCain. But this is not Senator John McCain. This is his father, Admiral John McCain, who I believe was the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific at the time. So here's the Oakland Tribune from Thursday, April 16th. Astronauts get landing instructions. And uh, it was quite uh, intense at Chabot that night. Um, we were doing a lot of plotting. And uh, this is an actual plot. Thank you, for Gerald McKeegan, who actually found this in the files of Chabot. This is from some of our data. And uh, you'll see that there's a red circle around the 6 um, o'clock um, time ch uh, check on there. You'll see it's dated 17th of April 1970, but this is in universal time, which is the time that astronomers use. So this is actually April 16th at 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time when we took this. We weren't on daylight savings time back then. And we had instructions to take that plot at exactly that time. And uh, there's only one reason for doing that, and that's because other observatories were going to take a plot at exactly that time. And if you have at least three widely spaced observatories, you can triangulate the position of the Apollo spacecraft in space. And that way you can confirm it's on the correct trajectory. So this is one of the ways that we did help with the rescue of Apollo 13. Now there were other ways to, to confirm that data, but I bet you NASA was quite reassured about this. The other thing I do want to emphasize that most people don't appreciate is that an, op an optical fix for position actually gives you a much more accurate position than a radio telescope, a big radar dish. So here's the headline from that uh, morning, Friday, April 17th, the day they came in. Aquarius coming in and there's Marilyn Lovell and, uh, and uh, Mary Hayes, who you can see is pregnant. And here is the four-year-old son of uh, Jim Lovell, Jeffrey Lovell, who is uh, discussed in the movie. And if they didn't have enough problems, sure enough, they actually also had a hurricane right next to the landing zone. It just never stops. Fortunately, the hurricane passed to the north. And uh, I want to show you one of my proudest uh, uh, possessions here. This is a signature autograph from Chuck Smiley. Dave, best wishes, Chuck Smiley, recovery helo pilot at Apollo 10 and 13. I got to know Chuck because I did a number of programs on the USS Hornet. And uh, many times I met Chuck there. He was a great guy. He became a, a good friend of mine. And uh, Chuck is the one who flew Apollo, the Apollo recovery helicopter, which is, I think, numbered uh, 66 in, in, in real life. It's the same uh, helicopter that recovered Apollo 11. Where is it now? At the bottom of the ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean, off the coast of San Diego. By the way, Chuck was the first person to actually see the reentry of, uh, of Apollo 13. Uh, his uh, co-pilot looked up and said, Chuck, is that Venus? And Chuck said, no, not unless Venus is orange, bright, bright reddish orange and has a tail to it. By the way, Chuck told me that he let the astronauts fly the helicopter back to American Samoa on the way back. He told me he had a lot of, had a lot of fun doing it. So anyway, I'm going to play the reentry clip from Apollo 13, the movie, and it really captures how we all felt. Uh, one of the things that happened was there was a... Uh, a delay in receiving the, the message, and you'll see speaking, speaking about delays in receiving the message, uh, one of the problems that some of our attendees were having tonight is that Facebook detected you were playing these clips uh -huh. and, uh, and dumped the, uh, the feed to uh, oh, oh, Facebook. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so their uh, DMCA detection works very, very well. So you um, see we have a problem. I, I filed a dispute. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do remember what it felt like. Um, I remember that minute and 30 seconds quite, quite well. And we were all thinking possibly we had lost the astronauts. Why did the one minute 30 second delay occur? Uh, there are a lot of speculations and arguments as to what happened. 
My personal favorite is the batteries got extremely cold. The inside of the command module actually got to the temperature of about somewhere between 38 to 32 degrees. By the way, something similar to that happened uh, when Columbia did its reentry. And uh, that time I was watching the TV screen and I went, oh shit, we've lost the, the space shuttle. We've lost seven very brave people. Let's never forget that space travel is extremely risky and extremely dangerous. It's when we forget that, that we lose astronauts. If we plan for the worst, the worst will never happen. We can hope. I wanna go back to my slide program um, and talk a little bit more about what happened and also about Chabot's role. I wanna make sure we save enough time for QA too. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, cl I'm close to done and I can wrap it up faster if I have to, Rich. So uh, let's see here. So uh, actually I am close to being done. Uh, let's see here, am I sharing that screen? I am. So uh, I wanted to also say that Chabot may have an even more important contribution to the story of Apollo 13. While we were following the return of the crippled spacecraft to Earth, we were also allowing the general public to view the spacecraft through our telescopes. We even had a small television set set up inside the dome of our largest telescope. Terry mentioned that with rabbit ears, uh, inside the dome of Rachel, so that the general public could fully appreciate that there where they saw that little tiny star through the telescope, three very brave men were desperately fighting to save their lives, along with tens of thousands of us back here on the Earth. But in another way, Chabot's contribution to the Apollo 13 story is even more important. Because among the many people who came to visit us in those exciting days were a number of young people. And one of them was this 13-year-old teenager in seventh grade at Bret Hart Junior High School. He got very excited about what he learned about the space program from us while he was visiting us, though we regard him as a bit of a failure because he didn't grow up to become an astronaut or a scientist. His name, Tom Hanks. In part, thanks to what he learned from us, he was able to get the role of Jim Lovell in the movie Apollo 13. The real Jim Lovell wanted a Kevin Costner play him because he had seen Dan the movie Dances with Wolves. But Tom called up Ron Howard, the producer of the movie Apollo 13, and told him, Ron, you gotta let me have this role. I know all about the accident, I know about the spacecraft systems, and the Apollo 1 fire. Ron said that he had been doing seven weeks pre-production and research on the Apollo 13 mission, and yet Tom knew more about it than he did. Finally, I think the broader lesson of this story is that it shows how the astronomical and scientific outreach of Chabot Space and Science Center and institutions like it can affect society and culture in a variety of beneficial ways that are impossible to anticipate. In just a few years from now, American astronauts, women now as well as men, will look out the windows of their spacecraft and see for real the view that you saw behind me. I have no doubts that some of them will have visited Chabot when they were 13 years old. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. I'll now take questions. I'm also gonna wipe the tears from my eyes. Thanks, Dave. Um, we actually have several questions. Uh, okay. I wanna encourage uh, people who are in the Zoom meeting to use the QA button at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions. Uh, you could also, uh, if you'd like, uh, just type them into the webinar chat and I will uh, see them there. Uh, the first is a comment rather than a question. Um, sure. um, our friend Bob Far uh, Garfinkel is listening in and oh, he yes. wanted to mention that the uh, liquid oxygen tank was tested in 1968 and installed in the service bay for the Apollo 13 craft on June 4th, 1968. And during the tank fill and empty tests after the tank was installed, they had a lot of problems, but they did yes. not think the electrical systems in the tank were damaged. They apparently had discussed it. The uh, Teflon coated wires had actually exceeded a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. Uh, and that caused the switch to weld shut, like you mentioned, which in turn caused the explosion. The voltage that was used was 65 volts DC. So, that was, I guess, the final voltage, if I understand Bob's uh, so, comment. So probably then the original voltage was something like 45 volts. I, yeah, I or 48 that. volts or something like that, yeah. some standard uh, 
uh, uh, voltage and it probably wasn't enough and they decided to raise it. Yeah, well, the thing is they were, can I just say something about Bob's sure. comment? Thank you, Bob, for making that explanation. I was a little reluctant to get into the nitty gritty of what happened with that tank incident. They, they, they were doing a test, they filled up the tank with oxygen, then they wanted to drain the, the, uh, the oxygen out of the tank and they were having trouble draining it out. So they decided to raise the temperature and pressure and uh, the, uh, the temperature gauge malfunctioned and uh, it didn't, wasn't giving them the correct temperature. I think it was indicating 60 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And in fact, as Bob pointed out, the temperature got up to a thousand degrees. Uh, un unbelievable thing. It's amazing it didn't explode there on the launch pad. Well, that might have been a better uh, outcome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well. Depends. Yeah. Um, uh, another question. Uh, do you think the Apollo 13 movie did the event justice? Overall, yes. I, I think, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of historical movies. Uh, I'm a big history fan. And uh, I, I, if you're not careful, I'll start listing all the historical movies that leave out critical incidents. Hollywood loves to embellish history and make it better. And they did it uh, to some extent here in the movie as well. Uh, for example, in, in reality, there was no argument among the astronauts as is portrayed in the movie. There are a number of scientific errors in the movie. But for the most part, I think the movie did uh, a great job in representing what happened. Uh, the astronauts uh, themselves love the movie. Uh, they also, by the way, love the music. Um. Did you see it explode? No, no. <laughs> uh, I have to, again, I have to say that was Monday night and I was actually home trying to see the TV broadcast that was never broadcast. Uh, I was shifting from channel to channel to channel. And I believe that Terry actually, despite what he said, I, the, the problem is this is 50 years ago. And, you know, we're all getting old and our memories are getting faint. And I used to talk this over with Terry and with some of the other participants. And we all had slightly different memories of exactly what happened. But I am pretty sure that Terry was actually not at Chabot when the explosion occurred. Also, the explosion would have been right about the beginning of uh, astronomical, the end of astronomical twilight for us. It was a little earlier than that. Uh, so we did not see it, I don't think. Uh, actually, I know that none of us saw it. And I was not there at the observatory, so I didn't see it. By the time Terry looked through the telescope, I believe the, the uh, explosive cloud around the spacecraft would have dissipated, so he wouldn't have seen it. Okay. Uh, a personal question yes. from uh, Diana. Have your feelings of the momentous nature of, this, of these events become more or less intense over time? More intense, more intense. You know- Why do you uh, think so? Uh, I'm going to try to explain why. Um, I think it's because of the accumulation of history. Um, you know, uh, when I was young, I had maybe too much confidence in NASA. Uh, I, I felt that uh, everything was under control and everything would come out okay. As I've grown older, I've become a little bit more skeptical of things like that. And I've seen some of the disasters that happened with NASA. I remember the, uh, the Challenger explosion very clearly. I remember losing Columbia on the reentry. Uh, I remember the Apollo 1 fire. Uh, and so what happens is, as time passes by, you begin to appreciate more and more how dangerous this enterprise is. And uh, you know, we're, we're now going to try to send people to the moon. We have a, a rather artificial deadline of the year 2024. And you know, they haven't even built some of the hardware for it. They're rushing. And uh, if they don't learn the lessons of history, we will, they and we will be doomed to repeat them. So I think that whole process has intensified my feelings when I watch the movie, because I'm not just thinking about what happened to the Apollo 13 astronauts, I'm thinking about what happened to Challenger and Columbia and what could happen in the future if, if we get careless. Well, I think you answered the next question, which was what lessons from Apollo 13 are applicable to future missions to the moon at pretty much everything, right? Yes. Um, the first thing I want to say is, um, and I have to emphasize this, space travel is really, really dangerous. And something that seems very, very innocuous, like a voltage shift on a, an instrument that most people even, don't even know exists, can, can imperil the lives of the astronauts flying there. So you have to be very, very sure of your ground uh, when, uh, 
when you do this. You cannot rush this. You have to make sure that everything works properly and you have to practice, practice, practice one step at a time. Uh, Dave, he's, Dave he's, like, like a ship, there is no ground in space. Yes. <laughs> Very true, Rich. Um, here's an interesting question from Joe. Uh, did the Apollo 13 uh, lunar module burn up in the atmosphere or is it eventually recoverable? Oh, that's a very good question. Well, it did burn up in the Earth's atmosphere uh, when it came back. It is possible that some fragments of it are underneath the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean somewhere, uh, perhaps recoverable. Uh, when I saw the Challenger explosion, I was convinced that nothing would survive that, but in fact, very large pieces of it did. So it's totally possible, I think, that uh, some bits of, uh, of the lunar module survive, especially parts that are that are better built. The, the one thing I would say though about the lunar module is it was built for lightness by Grumman uh, aircraft. Uh, if you watch the docking between the command module and the service module, watch very carefully the film. You'll see that the skin of the, of the lunar module will actually buckle. Uh, the, uh, the thickness of the skin of the lunar module is the thickness of about, I think five pieces of aluminum foil put together. It's unbelievably light. So that part of it, I don't think could have survived. Um, Bob Garfinkel again pointed out a great error. <laughs> Thank you. Mine? <laughs> He's a very detailed oriented person. He is indeed. Uh, he knows his one, stuff. <laughs> one big error is when the rocket launches, they show yeah. you in, they show in the movie the ground around the launch pad. Yes. Look closely and you will see lots of cars. What happened is that Ron's crew flew over the launch site taking photographs for the movie, not realizing that all of the cars had been removed for the actual, um, for the actual launch. Um, so. Can I, can I make an additional comment to what Bob just said there? Yeah. Uh, two other things. Um, first is in the movie, you do see um, uh, the, the um, Ken Mattingly character uh, parked in his, uh, with his, um, his Corvette, uh, within oh, yeah. <laughs> a mile and a half. No ass, nobody would be allowed right. within five miles of, of, of the spacecraft. The Saturn V had the power of a small atomic bomb. The, yeah, the, 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 I guess the closest uh, observing would have been from the, uh, the bleachers that they set up, uh, but most people had to go across the Titusville or places yeah. like that to watch it. Now it's, I have to say, it's been my privilege to sit in those bleachers to watch launch of some friend spacecraft. And uh, it's, it's really neat to, to be that close and, and see it. And uh, it's, it's really thrilling, but it's also a little scary because you have friends that have worked on an experiment for 10 years and you know at any second, uh, if there's a rocket malfunction, they, they could lose the, the work of uh, a large part of their lifetime. Do you know of any other observatories providing visual coordinates for triangulation besides Chabot? I don't know of specific observatories, although okay. I was told roughly where they were. Uh, I was told that there were observatories uh, or in Washington State and Oregon State. And the night before the, uh, the re-entry, that Thursday night, uh, there was a, a storm front that was coming in from the Northwest and it wiped out those observatories, which made our observation all the more important. I believe also there was a, a, an observatory in Southern, or maybe a couple in Southern California somewhere. I don't know where, and also probably probably or possibly, I'm under the impression, Arizona or New Mexico as well. Sure. The one problem I have to say though, is that you have to understand that the, the, the spacecraft was visible in low in the Northwestern sky uh, at that time. Um, we were looking towards Oakland and we had some light glow and light pollution from Oakland. And that um, it made it more difficult for us to observe the spacecraft, especially as it got lower in the sky. And then, then we got clouded out at about, I think, 11 o'clock that night, the night before the re-entry. Um, next question, I could actually answer this. Uh, it was uh, Catherine Johnson involved with the rescue of Apollo 13. And uh, Catherine Johnson, of course, uh, was uh, uh, a mathematician who worked for uh, NASA. And uh, uh, she was, uh, I'm having, uh, uh, a senior moment. What was the name of the movie that she hidden was? Hidden uh, Figures. Yeah, Hidden Figures. Uh, she was involved in the rescue of Apollo 13. She was part of the team that was plotting trajectories. And they uh, mentioned that on the Wikipedia page. By the way, she might have gotten some of our data. Yeah. Um, 
Well, there's an interesting question. So, you know, we're now several decades down the row, row of um, uh, several decades down the row, and uh, uh, we've got some new spacecraft coming online, SpaceX, uh -huh. uh, NASA is going to have some new spacecraft. So are there citizen science opportunities for spacecraft tracking and that type of thing in the future? Or is, the, is everything so automated and there's so much equipment out there now, both in Earth and in space, uh, that we don't need anything like that anymore? Well, um, in terms of the technology, we've gotten so much better at technology <clears throat> and the spacecraft, spacecraft tracking systems are so much more robust than they were back then. You know, one thing I do want to say is, uh, you won't believe this, but in the early days of the space program, uh, in the early 60s, we used to launch spacecraft to the moon and we would miss the moon. That's how bad it was. Um, I remember one Ranger mission in particular was quite embarrassing. Uh, Bob's going to correct me here, but Bob, give cut me some slack on this one. Uh, but uh, one thing I do want to say is that an important role for observatories like Chabot will be to allow the general public to observe manned spacecraft and woman spacecraft as they travel to the moon and also onto Mars. That will be very, very thrilling. And who knows what children will be in our audience looking through our telescopes when we do something like that. We may have a future Tom Hanks, or we may have a future president of the United States who will become so inspired by what he sees that he'll strongly support scientific research. Or we may have a senator or a congressman, or who knows who, uh, a great teacher who will inspire people. So well, on, that, on that note, uh, 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 one of our listeners uh, mentioned that ham radio is an official uh, radio backup for the International Space Station. Yes. So there already is a uh, an official role for amateurs, um, both in radio and in astronomy. Uh, a Facebook question. Yeah. Uh, were the Apollo missions tracked during the entire duration of their flights from liftoff to splashdown? And I assume he means uh, by amateurs. I would assume NASA is attempting to track at all times uh, everything. Yeah. And, uh, but what about uh, the time slice where uh, amateurs were asked? Well, uh, I do not believe that any amateurs overseas were asked to help with the tracking program. And perhaps I'm totally wrong on that, but I never heard about them. Now, the problem, of course, is that the Earth rotates. So the moon and where the spacecraft were were not always within our, our visible range. Furthermore, even if it's daytime when the moon and the spacecraft are up there, we couldn't see it through the, the, uh, the telescopes. We had to wait until the sunset. So we only had a narrow slice of opportunity from our line of longitude to be able to observe the spacecraft. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the first opportunity to see it would have been uh, observatories on the east coast of the United States. And then as the sun set, it would gradually transfer to the middle of the country and then finally to us. Okay, uh, one of our uh, young listeners has asked, how long did it take to find the spacecraft after it went off track from the explosion? Uh, it actually, I'm trying to remember how long it took Terry to find it. It took him, I think, about 15, 20 minutes to find it. It wasn't far off track. I think Terry exaggerates a little bit how far off track it was. My recollection is that it was not quite that far. Um, and I have a variety of reasons for saying that. Um, so that was using a, like, a, a grid search, right? Just basically yeah. stepping well, through the grid, using the telescope until you find the, uh, uh, something that didn't belong. Yeah, what, what happened was uh, Belcom mass would actually give us a prediction as to what the right ascension and declination would be. That, of course, is fancy astronomy talk for the latitude and longitude up in the sky as to where we could look. And they were usually a little bit off. It would took a little bit of searching sometimes. And I have to say that the spacecraft, the, especially the command and service module, were extremely faint. They were on the order of a 13th magnitude star, which I know doesn't mean much to regular folks out there. Folks, that's really, really dim. Um, and uh, so I think it took Terry probably about 15, 20 minutes to find it, judging by what he told sounds about. That sounds about right. Okay. Um, 
So uh, uh, one clarification, uh, there was a question about how cold batteries could have delayed re-entry. It didn't delay re-entry. Yeah. What it did is it delayed radio communications. Exactly. A cold, ba a cold battery would not have been able to output enough uh, wattage to uh, uh, complete the communication. And once it warmed up a little bit, they were probably having better success. Yeah, and can I say one other thing about that? I did mention that my friend Chuck Smiley did observe the re-entry of the spacecraft. But that doesn't mean that the astronauts survived. Uh, that just could have meant that it was just a, a burning hulk that was coming back to Earth and the astronauts had already been incinerated to death. So that's why that radio signal was, was so critical. And every time I watch that, I, I think about that minute and a half, I think it was actually a minute 45 seconds that we waited and thinking, oh my God, you know, did I screw up? Did I do, make some mistake? You remember, I was 17 years old, right? Did I do something to contribute to losing the astronauts? Uh, Ray asked, uh, uh, Ray Howard asked uh, uh, a bit about the uh, plot that you showed. Uh, was that Terry's work on the plot of uh, where he recorded the positions? Yeah, actually that was Terry's work with, with some help from a bunch of us. Um, the, the, uh, the six o'clock UT uh, observation, to my recollection, was actually done by Terry himself. And the way we usually did it is we had one person looking through the telescope and another person writing down the WWDP time and the right ascension and declination on Rachel. Um, and uh, for example, when I would observe uh, these tumbling panels, I, if I was the observer, I, there'd be somebody else with a, basically a clipboard and a piece of paper with time stamp. And you know, we had WWV, we could hear it, playing it loud. So we actually would write down the time and uh, if I saw a flash, I would say flash. Uh, Terry did that observation, I believe, with a 600 power. Well, first we tried it. We, we would cap acquire the spacecraft with a wider field eyepiece that was about 200 power. It was about a, a field of view of about a quarter degree. And then we'd slap on the higher powered eyepiece to try to get it as much in the center as possible uh, for uh, the time that we were supposed to make the observation. Great. Um, and, and, and part of the question also was, where did that plot come from? I believe it was from the Chabot archives, right? It actually came from the Chabot archives. We actually owe um, uh, 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 Gerald, a Gerald uh, McKeegan, a Gerald, if you're out there, thank you very, 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 very much for giving me that report. Boy, does it bring back memories. And um, I have to say, I was overjoyed to see it because um, we actually, uh, Terry told me we actually got a letter of commendation from NASA for our contributions to helping save Apollo 13. And Terry also kept a lot of his data. He kept his data all, and the letter at his house. Unfortunately, his house was at the epicenter of the Oakland Hills fire. Uh, Terry barely escaped with his life, but all the records went up in the fire, sadly. And so I was overjoyed to see that Gerald had acquired found some of this in Chabot's archives. Yeah, that I also, quite a point. Yeah, I also yeah. want to say also that somewhere, either in Chabot's archives or in a storage unit from Carter's house, <laughs> there, <laughs> right. there is a drawing I did of what, it, of what the, first, the third stage of the Saturn V looked like and the command and service module and the tumbling panels, which you could see through the telescope. Uh, one time I was at the old Chabot and Terry said to me, you want to see something? And he opened up the, the vault that was in the basement there right by Rachel. He pulled this thing out and said, look what I have here. And I, I saw my, my own drawing there. Uh, <laughs> and I wondered what happened to that. And, and, uh, and Denny Medlock told me that the night before they moved the big telescope, Carter raided the vault. And he, put, he took personal possession of what was in there, I suspect. So, so I suspect it's in your storage unit. It's in, it's in storage yeah. unit. Yeah. It's in your storage <laughs> unit. Um, next question is, what are some good resources for us absolute amateurs to learn more about astronomy? Well, I can answer that oh, one. Oh, please. Yeah. Well, first of all, you're in one of those places right now. Uh, definitely uh, stay in touch with the East Bay Astronomical Society at eastbayastro.org. We will be doing something like this every month. In fact, our next uh, speaker is scheduled for the 16th of next month. It's going to be Stephen Ramsden from the uh, Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Program in Georgia. Uh, <coughs> one of the things that uh, our current situation has allowed us to do is get uh, speakers from farther afield who we would never imagine having uh, come all the way out to the West Coast to speak to us. So anyway, um, uh, Stephen's gonna be uh, sharing uh, his experience with solar astronomy uh, uh, next month. 
Um, the Chabot Space and Science Center is an invaluable resource in the Bay Area. And if you're not a member of Chabot, you should become a member of Chabot. If you have children, become a member of Chabot, get a family membership. Um, eventually, uh, we'll be getting back to something that resembles normalcy and uh, the exhibits and the facilities there are a wonderful way to get educated about astronomy. Absolutely. Um, I'm seeing if there's any other questions here. Uh, I think that's about it. Well, thank you. I want to say yeah, what an honor you. is to participate in this historic first uh, virtual meeting of East Bay Astronomical Society. Rich, once again, I want to thank you. Without your very capable technical help, this my contribution would have been a disaster. Well, considering Facebook busted us for uh, 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 content violation, we may need legal help too. <laughs> I know some good attorneys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for participating. We had over 100 participants tonight, and uh, I appreciate everyone's uh, um, uh, interest, and we'll see you next month. Apollo 13.